Dear reader, listener, we are almost at the end. If you have not already done so, please subscribe to my channel. If you're beginning this audio version of TOT on week 31, I would advise going back to listen to weeks 1 through 30 and the foreword and prologue. All of these are in order in the playlist and can be accessed on the YouTube channel TOT at TOT 2022. This character's journal makes much more sense if you start at her beginning. Thank you for reading, listening. Taught, Week 31. Sunday, March 26th, 2017, 7 a.m. Well, guess who's not happy about Paulo getting a job? Grandma. Which is really unfair because she should want us to move forward in life. But she doesn't want us to move, period. Even when I promised I would still call frequently and make my two visits per year, she was not happy. We ended that conversation with her sniffing and stating that she guessed this is just what happens when you're 80. No one cares anymore. (sighs) It would be nice to have either a joy or concern that I could state and then just get support for. I mean, I really need someone to talk to right now. It's not grandma's responsibility to fill my mom void, but yeah, I need a caring, listening ear. And a mom figure would be nice. I'm scared. And I feel like we have to do this for us, but what if we're wrong? What if we can't afford to live there? What if I can't make any friends? What if we just fail all of this? What then? But I can't say any of this because now this is about grandma. And if I voice any of these concerns, she'll leap on them and make them somehow more concerning. Silver lining. I am looking forward to dropping this bombshell on my school district. Good luck making me do anything I don't want to between now and May 17th. I know they say no one's irreplaceable, but really I am. I expect some begging to happen, and I have decided that I will handle it graciously so that no one gets embarrassed. Paulo has strongly suggested waiting to say anything to anyone until closer to the end of April. He prefers a well-kept secret to potentially having to grovel to get my job back, should something catastrophic happen to prevent us from leaving. He also feels that they will figure it out when I tell him they're going to want to start thinking about my replacement as soon as possible. Now, the implication here is that my school district can live without me. Actually, it wasn't implied. It was said by him. But I'm choosing to forgive him for this clear lack of understanding of how awesome I really am. He is a mere citizen, not a teacher himself, so he has no foundational knowledge of what constitutes an amazing teacher. Therefore, his opinion is really not that legitimate on this particular issue. Monday, March 27th, 2017, 4 p.m. Sometimes I think I should call this journal Paulo told me so. I sent Anita an email as soon as I got to school requesting to talk to her. I could hardly wait to give her the good news. I mean, who doesn't long for the moment to say, F you, I quit. I have to work until the end of my contract, but I assumed it would be satisfying without the walking out. I pranced into her office at the designated time to find her very distracted but polite. I told her I had to tell her something very important. I wouldn't be coming back next year. Then I sat back and waited. She politely thanked me for letting her know and asked me if I needed help with the process. Only four days left for me to submit my resignation letter according to our contracts. Or did I have it and want her to send it over to HR? Nope. Just wanted her to hear it from me first. She smiled a genuine smile and told me she hoped I had secured a position somewhere that I would be happy. While I had been an asset to the school, she knew that someone with my skills would always be looking to advance their career. She wished me well. Big takeaway here is that I had not anticipated talking about what I would be doing after the actual quitting. Fortunately for me, she assumed I was quitting because I'd taken another position. But eventually, I would need reference letters, and then it would be clear that I did not have another job, and now this quitting seems highly irresponsible. Who quits without another job? But Paulo has a job, so I'm quitting so Paulo can take care of me. Well, that doesn't ring well either. I should have thought through this much better.
pretty anticlimactic, no gnashing of teeth, definitely no begging. The whole conversation was less than five minutes, and she never even asked me why I was leaving. And I genuinely believe she does wish me well. Weird and unexpected. I feel sad. It's one thing to talk with Paulo about moving and doing other things, but actually doing those things, well, that's like big and scary. It takes courage to dump one life and strut into another. Pretty sure it doesn't happen in a way that there isn't suffering involved. I'm not a good sufferer. And what about Megan, Lewis, Phil, and my new project, Adam? Who's going to fish his yes-no cards out of the trash day after day? I told Anita before I even said anything to Kelly, how am I going to leave my teaching bestie? I don't know a soul in Seattle. How will I get to the grocery store? My driving skills are not great in this rural area. I'll be expected to drive in traffic. And I'm going 80 miles per hour right now because I have myself close to a panic attack thinking about what all of this really means. All of this means that school is the least of the things that will be affected by this decision. And I'm ill prepared to figure out what comes after the school phase of things. Also, today, I found out my HR nemesis is out this week. She apparently is on an extended trip to Mexico probably because she had enough days saved up for this lovely holiday. I hope she enjoys it because I intend to make her life hell when she returns. So drink up, Helen, because La Diabla is waiting for you. Tuesday, March 28th, 2017, 6.30 a.m. Why do I call my grandma? She was all set with a list of statistics about Seattle via a 24-hour marathon of watching CNN. Summary, housing costs are outrageous and the teachers are always going on strike. I will likely be homeless and jobless should I continue down this reckless path. However, she saw that there were several homeless camps in Seattle, so maybe we could find a nice spot in one of those. She still has my dad's Boy Scout tent out in the garage. Would I like to take it? Still Tuesday, March 28th, 2017, 4 p.m. Kelly is not happy with me. She called me a traitor today, but she did it in a way that let me know she will still love me after I leave. I really thought this whole telling people I was moving and quitting would be more fun and more, how do you like me now? Turns out it's sad, and I am learning volumes about the dys dysfunctional family I aligned myself with for nine years. One, they are mainly comprised of people who do not give a shit about what I do unless it is negative gossip worthy. And two, the ones who don't fall into that first group are kind and supportive of me moving to the next phase of my life. Where is my officer and gentleman moment? Come on, people. My Latino lover got a great job and is carrying me out of the fucking factory. I deserve to see people writhing on the floor in envy. I deserve for a weeping table to be set up in the commons where colleagues mourn the fact that I am leaving this district one excellent teacher short. I deserve a going away party with presents. Well, that may be the definition of delusions of grandeur, all that stuff. Anyway, as I suffered the reality of mediocrity and apathy today, I also had my meeting with Marie over the creepy Adam drawings I found. She asked me how she could help me with this. I'm sorry, Marie, whose name is signed at the bottom of the IEP as the case manager? It's not mine. Okay, it's not Marie's either, because Adam is new, and Marie has not updated the IEP yet, but you know what I mean. Then Marie stoically informed me that creepy drawings are not covered in the IEP, so just treat it like I would if any student had done the drawings. Okay, never happened before. I've dealt more in pornography, primarily dick pics, hand-drawn, also known as rockets. This is just more evidence that special education is a fake science used by school districts to pacify parents and communities into believing that all kids can learn these certain things exactly the same as long as we have hours of meetings and reams of paperwork. False.
or maybe I'm pissed because once again, I have another broken kid that I feel I have to figure out on my own. I know Marie's overloaded, but so am I. We're supposed to be a team. That's why it's called an IEP team. So how do I know when this is an IEP issue and when it is a do it the way you would with your other kids issue? Because I've been at several meetings where I had my ass handed to me for treating a kid on an IEP the same way I have the other kids. And I'm sick of the resources I'm supposed to have to help me being unavailable to me. If I wanted to be a SPED teacher, a school counselor, a case manager, I would have gone those directions. It's beyond me why I have to assume these jobs and teach. Not fair. Marie has not offered once to come in and do my job. Why do I have to do hers? Bottom line, here's another area that I need help with, and there is none and no one to go to. Wednesday, March 29th, 2017, 4 p.m. I use the fact that my students are working on their papers to start looking at jobs in the Seattle area for teachers. That brought back to my mind that I am going to need some letters of reference. And then that led to regret for some of my actions this school year. Mm. Well, if I'm going to start applying for jobs, I'm going to have to ask some people for letters of recommendation. Better ask everyone I know so I have an assortment to choose from. That will up my chances of getting a couple of good ones. Today's been a hard day. My mind is more distracted than ever now that I'm obsessively thinking about moving. Paulo has found us an apartment and already put the deposit on it. We haven't even seen this place, but his new company handled most of the details and he trusts his new team. He actually starts working next week. He'll work both jobs Monday through Wednesday because he wants to honor his two week notice. He also set up the delivery for the moving crates to be delivered June 28th. That's like 12 weeks away. So yeah, lots of stress, lots of distraction, but that's only one part of why things seem hard today. Lewis is now coming to my room at the end of every day and asking me for a hug. He started up again a few weeks ago. I don't want to think about what this means in terms of his mom and her availability for him. He's a small guy for an eighth grader, more the size of a third grader, and he hugs like a toddler, all in and basking in the comfort of physical affection. I can't say no, and I do the teacher side hug, and he lingers with his eyes closed like this is the best part of his day. Then he tells me goodbye, and he'll see me tomorrow. Because Lewis's shaky home life is not enough distraction for me, Counselor Charles came to let me know that Adam would not be here for a couple of days, some sort of family crisis. While I wasn't happy to hear this about Adam, I also hoped it would clear up the mystery. So I asked lots of questions about the details. Charles, per his usual, was the most unhelpful person I could be asking. He did share that the family had called and stated that none of their children would be attending school. They had some at the elementary and high school level too, for a few days. Didn't say if it was a death in the family, just a family emergency. This is all Charles knew, or at least wanted to talk about. He had completely forgotten that Adam didn't speak, ever, and wasn't really interested in unpacking how that might fit into a family emergency. Marie was in meetings all afternoon, so I never got the chance to analyze this with her, but I'm pretty relieved to have a break from Adam, because my newfound interest in him and helping him has only heightened that there is a definite problem with this kid. Even if he could talk or communicate, I would feel like something is very off. I'm only going to put this in here because it's my journal. A few years ago, my then neighbor, different apartment complex, had a cat that kept showing up to be fed. She kept food out for it, and it continued to come day after day. I never liked this cat. In fact, I was repelled by this cat, and I love animals. Well, not the slimy ones, but most animals I love, especially cats and dogs. But this cat did not act like a cat. There are certain things that all cats do, ways they move and respond. This cat did not do those things. He did animal things, just not in the expected or normal way. 
For example, he never acted like he knew which of us was actually feeding him. All humans were potential givers of food, but he wouldn't meow and rub on your leg like most cats do when they want you to feed them. He would look at you blankly, almost like he was looking through you, and then meow this really weird meow. But he wouldn't approach you or go near his food bowl. My neighbor would pet him, but he seemed indifferent to it, and I never heard him purr. I'm explaining this poorly, but there was something abnormal about that cat. And something primal deep within me responded to this animal with repulsion and distrust. And then one day it happened. As my neighbor was emptying a can of food into the dish, the cat went berserk and bit and scratched her up pretty good. Her screaming drew a few of us outside. We helped her inside and the guy two doors down told her she should go to the hospital because she needed her wounds cleaned and there would be a discussion about rabies shots. I called animal control and they asked me to keep an eye on the cat until they got there. This wasn't hard because the cat had settled in to eat his food after the attack. For him, it was like it never happened. I was very relieved when animal control took him 30 minutes later. And this is the part that I would never say to anyone else, but there's something about Adam that reminds me of that cat. And I can't tell anyone because it sounds heartless, but I will enjoy having a break from him. Thursday, March 30th, 2017, 4 p.m. I am exhausted. So Amy's holding tight. Her due date was today. She looks miserable. She, who never raises her voice to anyone, has made her presence in detention land known in the past month or so. She's all the talk of the students in the hall. Get your homework done and have what you need for class because Ms. Brown will lose her shit and give your ass detentions until you just expect your school day to go an extra hour every day. The para who monitors the after-school detention room feels Amy is his best customer right now. It's always the quiet ones. They are the ones who get hit with the hormonal wave the hardest. For Amy, pregnancy hormones have brought out her Ms. Hyde. And once again, I am loving it. I had gone to her room just to check in on her today. I was standing in her doorway, door open, and she was sitting at her desk, and I'm not even sure what we were talking about when a student named Michael came sauntering up. I had the misfortune of having Michael for a bit in my intervention group last year. He's one of those frustrating kids that you cannot get to do anything. He asked me, because I was in the doorway, if he could go in and talk to Ms. Brown. She said no before I could even ask. Michael stood there uncertain, and Amy went back to our chat. Michael again asked me if he could go in. Amy again said no, and Yell asked from her desk, what did he want? Michael looked at me and explained that he needed a copy of some assignment. He got halfway through his explanation when Amy again said no. I shrugged and tried to look sympathetic and told him there were no copies. Amy yells from her desk that there are copies. He just can't have one because she's already given him three. Michael just stands there, looking imploringly at me. I shrug again. He then explains to me that Mr. Frankie won't let him into, det into detention without the assignment he's serving the detention for. So he has to go to detention, but he can't get into detention. I really thought at this point that Amy would give me permission to let him have the fourth copy. I mean, what's the kid supposed to do? But no, she yelled from her desk this was not her problem and it was time for him to go. I think my face mirrored Michael's. What now? He slowly walked off and I decided to get out of there myself before I got a detention or worse. I would not want to be one of Amy's students right now. Woo! They better hope that baby comes soon. The other thing that happened today is that Adam was back. It's just like Charles to get my hopes up that a tough student will be gone for a while and then it turns into one day. He was tidied up, neat, well-fitting clothes, combed hair, and for the first time his eyes were coming to life. 
like he was now aware of everything, whereas before he'd been gone to some dead space where only he dwelled. But his alertness wasn't necessarily a good thing. He still didn't speak, and the new light in his eyes was that of a wary caged animal. And it seems a new outfit and hair is not the solution to not talking, because despite being creepily over-aware, he still didn't utter a sound. Now I've done a little research on selective mutism lately, and for the life of me, I cannot figure out what to do. If this is anxiety-based, I don't really get why none of my or Marie's efforts to reduce stress at school have had no effect on anything, work production or communication. During journal time, I glanced at his journal over his shoulder. He was writing why over and over in different font styles and sizes on the same page. At the end of journal time, I gave him a note and asked him if he was okay and did he need an easier day today. He could just journal if that's what he wanted. He responded in writing, no, he was not okay, leave me alone. Okay, he would just journal. I left him alone at that point and he laid his head down. Later, I noticed him writing in his own personal journal. He did this from time to time and always took his journal with him when he left class. Of course, he usually left his ELA journal on the desk for me to put in the class crate along with his yes, no cards to fish out of the trash. But today he left his personal journal on his desk along with the ELA journal and he didn't even bother to throw the yes, no cards away. I picked it all up and put it on my desk to glance at after school, but then I went to Amy's room, so I'll check it out tomorrow. The poor kid was clearly experiencing trauma on top of trauma, and that why page may need to be submitted to Marie or Charles to share with the family. Maybe it was somehow related to their crisis or emergency. Megan came in as Adam was leaving, and she asked me when he started talking. He is quite a talking point for his peers since he avoids all interaction with them. I told her to my knowledge he wasn't. She said he had just, she said he just had as she passed him. She was really freaked out about it because she said that his voice was creepy. I asked her what she heard him say, and she said she couldn't make it out. It was growling and laughing and words all at once, according to her. I really wish someone less dramatic and excitable had been close to him when this happened. Friday, March 31st, 2017, 7 p.m. This morning when I got to school, I started by going through the stuff I had collected that Adam had left. The ELA journal first. Just the Y page was new and that was it. Then I opened Adam's personal journal. I want to note that I nearly rushed out into the hall yesterday to find him and give him this journal back without looking at it. I might have heard him talking if I'd done that. Part of me wishes I had given it to him and not looked. There were more drawings, but these drawings were terrifying. I had never seen anything like it. They were gory and violent, and there was a theme. This dark figure who wore a long black trench coat and had long black hair delightfully tortured any other figure that came into the drawings, even when he or she had been affectionate to the creature. Dismemberment and beheading were clearly the preferred tortures and burning. There was a picture of a baby being burned alive in a stroller. I will likely never be able to unsee that picture. As I flipped through horrific page after horrific page, I started finding notes that I had written to Adam since he had been at our school. The note would be neatly tucked into the seam where the journal pages were bound and a picture corresponding to the note would be drawn on the page behind. First note, welcome to our class, Adam. I'm glad to have you here. If you need anything, you can write to me in your journal. I'll check it every day. Picture, dark figure laughing maniacally and saying, oh, fuck you, ha 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 ha, fuck you, fuck you. Next note. Hello, Adam. I like your shirt. Do you want to work with a partner today? No. Do you want to work with me? No. You need to visit three websites on your topic and put the websites down on the worksheet. Okay. Picture. Dark figure in a coffin with blood seeping out of all the seams of the coffin. 
Next note. You seem tired today. Is there anything I can do to help? If you need to take breaks during research time today, that's okay, smiley face. Picture. Dark figure laying in bed with an evil smile. A dream cloud is above her, his head, and it's full of bloodied knives and axes. Next note. I'm worried about you. How are you? Fine. Are you going to be able to do some research today? IDK. Picture. Dark figure with head on folded arms, weeping either black tears or they could be blood tears. This went on and on. I know a tingling had started at the back of my neck and knot had begun forming in my stomach. As I continued to look at disturbing picture after disturbing picture, I began feeling like I was leaving my body with the huge tight knot in my stomach. Then I got to yesterday. Note, are you okay? No. Do you need an easier day today? Leave me alone. You can just journal today if you want to. Smiley face. Okay. Picture. It was a cartoon strip. The dark figure dragging a choking, bloody person behind them on a noose. The dark figure is smiling and whistling. There are several bodies hanging from nooses in the background. The body being drug has teacher neatly written on it, and each frame got worse. I don't think I can describe the other frames. I can't choke the words out. But teacher doesn't come out of this okay. I felt like I was watching this happen to someone else, and I knew it was me, and I also knew that I was about to vomit. They were pencil drawings, anime style. He's a gifted artist, and the drawings were super detailed. But the messages they portrayed were graphic and disturbing in ways only horror movies are. I felt fear in a way I've never felt it. I knew in the depths of my soul that this student wants to kill me, for real kill me, like in a very violent, torturous way. And he wants me to know he had left these for me. I took it immediately to Derek, who was in his office. Thank God. He flipped through and frowned. I whispered that I did not want Adam back in my class until this was handled. He stretched back in his desk chair and clasped his hands behind his head. He stared at the ceiling for about 15 seconds and then said he didn't blame me, and he would talk to Anita and Charles. They would get back to me this morning. I felt relieved that he was taking this as seriously as I was. At least I was protected now and wouldn't have to face Adam in my class. School hadn't even started yet, and Derek called me to his office, and Anita was there also. He introduced me to Gwendolyn Meyer, the tri-district risk assessment psych. I didn't know such a thing existed, and obviously her work was so specialized that three school districts could share her, and she still could show up on short notice. She was very kind and told me the assessment she would do would consist of her asking questions that were specifically designed to determine how much of a risk this kid was for self-harm or other types of harm. I was pretty sure this was one test that Adam would ace. As I was leaving Derek's office, Gwendolyn squeezed my arm and told me that she'd have answers for me before school was over today. And sure enough, Anita came to my seventh hour class and told me she was covering for me so I could go talk to Gwendolyn and Derek. Why does everything happen during seventh hour? Gwendolyn was actually gone when I got there. Adam had arrived to school per usual and was inter intercepted right off the bus. I have to admit it's disturbing to think that he was riding on the bus with other kids. Then they had interviewed Adam in one of the conference rooms. Derek explained that he, Anita, and Gwendolyn had spent a few hours going over the interview and results. Interesting. Wonder why I wasn't a part of that process. None of them has had as much interaction as I have with Adam. It was determined, Derek continued, that Adam was not a threat to harming himself. That was surprising. I asked how they knew this. Did he tell them? Did he actually talk to them? No. Gwendolyn had devised a system for Adam to answer with choices. Yes, no, sometimes, never, always. 
he would touch his choice with a pencil. The list of questions was enormous, and Gwendolyn had scribbled lots of notes in the margins. Derek had made a copy for me, but he wanted me to know what the takeaway was. While Adam was not at risk to self-harm, he was at a very high risk to harm others. Come to find out, this was the family crisis. Something, and no one on our end knew exactly what, had happened that involved one of Adam's siblings, the police, and Adam being taken into county hospital for a 24-hour hold. Apparently, we were supposed to be notified by someone. Not sure if it was parents or the hospital. But no, Adam somehow ended up on the bus coming to school as usual this morning and the morning before and the morning before. All of this came out after mom was required to come and pick Adam up today. She was very frustrated that they had already done a hospital eval and now due to our risk assessment policy, it would have to do another hospital eval. Starting Monday, according to Derek, we would need to have a plan for Adam's reentry to school. It would likely involve keeping all sharps away from him, especially when he was in my class, because according to mom and Adam, he typically focused in on one person. His older brother and I are the lucky ones he's honed in on. None of his other teachers were having any issues with him. So we would focus on my class first. Adam's mom had finally agreed that he would have a psychiatric evaluation done before he would be back at school, so that should buy us some time. Any questions? Yeah. How did this kid miss everyone's radar this long? Because he had been in a school before ours, and we had nothing saying that there had ever been any problem. He just didn't talk, and no one knew why. Paulo's working an extra day to train his replacement, and Mimi has been content to play with Play-Doh this evening. I strap her into her booster, put the tray on, and let her go. She's pretty good for two. I can actually tell what she's making, and she's into it, which is nice for me, because I'm feeling like something deep within me is crumbling, and I can't define what that crumbling thing is. My innocence? Naivete? Belief in humanity? believe in the education system, all of it, whatever it is, it's painful. Well, mostly painful. It's like I go back and forth between wanting to cry, wrenching sobs from my innermost places to just feeling numb. <laughs>